what I'll be talking about uh, today, uh, as Antonio hinted, is uh, one of the two uh, topics in philosophy of space and time that I'm actually competent to talk about. One is um, uh, Mach's principle and how it may or may not be cashed out in various physical theories. And the other is um, the whole argument and um, related questions of a metaphysical and, and methodological nature um, from the whole argument literature. And that's what I'll be uh, talking about today. Um, as you all know, uh, since Ehrman and Norton's original paper was published in 1987, the um, discussions prompted by the whole argument um, <clears throat> became a booming philosophy industry in its own right with hundreds, literally hundreds of papers having been written uh, on the topic in one form or another. And because of that, um, I think that I can count on everybody understanding what the original whole argument was supposed to show. Um, just in case I put this lovely diagram, uh, which is from the hand of John Norton. Those of you familiar with John Norton's works will recognize the artwork instantly. And this shows how um, we can have uh, a model of general relativity in which we've got um, space time as the, the sheet of paper and the matter and uh, metrical contents distributed over space and time. And uh, if this is a valid solution of Einstein's field equations, then so is this other one to the right uh, on the screen, where we have taken the contents of space and time, as it were, and just shifted them in a little region called the whole. Um, so if, for example, in our first model of general relativity, um, the galaxy uh, in the middle uh, passed through a, a point, which we might um, Sorry, can, can you all see my cursor as I move it around? Uh, not really. No, no. no. Okay, you're not seeing the cursor. So I'll use my, my voice then for a pointer. So the middle galaxy, um, as you can see on the right-hand uh, version of the, of the picture, it has been sort of shifted over. And that's with respect to space-time points, which we take as fixed on the, the sheet as the background. And so Ehrman and Norton claimed that uh, what this amounts to is that if you believe in substantivalism, that is, you believe in the space-time manifold as representing a substantival space, then general relativity turns out to be indeterministic um, because the way things stand at the, uh, the lower uh, time slice that we see in the, in the left-hand side is the same between the two models, uh, but later developments, particularly the developments in the region we call the whole, are different between the two models, and that they claimed amounted to a kind of indeterminism. So as I said, hundreds of papers have appeared on the whole argument since 1987. Um, and in the, uh, at least as of the late 90s, there started to be something that was, uh, started becoming referred to as a consensus view of how to disarm the whole argument. Um, and yet, despite uh, some people talking about a consensus view, um, the literature didn't ever stop. And in fact, in, in the most recent decade has burgeoned even more. And I'll be talking about some of the reasons behind this uh, and also what the consensus view amounts to um, the way I think we should understand it. Now, what I want to claim is that the culprit or one of the culprits of this continued burgeoning literature is the most insubstantial thing that there could be in existence, namely a space-time point, or the idea, the very idea of space-time points as bits of physical reality. And hence the title of my talk, Much Ado About uh, Nothing. I don't quite want to say that space-time points are nothing, but um, uh, nothing maybe that we need to pay attention to in the philosophy of space and time. So let's see. Um, here's what the uh, talk will do. Uh, um, I gave a, a brief introduction. Um, I will then distinguish two strands of recent papers that have come out uh, in the whole argument literature. Um, <clears throat> then I will develop two uh, kind of main theses that I want to, to try to argue for in the talk. The first one 
is that the, the bulk of the whole argument literature um, in both of the strands that I'll be distinguishing continues to be founded uh, upon the commission of two philosophical sins. And I'll, I'll explain shortly what those philosophical sins are. Um, and the second thesis will be um, towards the end of the talk that um, symmetry-based arguments using various kinds of thought experiments to motivate um, hexiotism, whether uh, of the standard or cheap variety, and we'll, we'll talk about what that means later, um, can be easily resisted. Um, and these, are, these symmetry based arguments are arguments for resisting the consensus view that I mentioned before. And so then I'll come in the end to concluding that um, what I will describe as full blown anti hexiotism which can be also understood as rejecting primitive identity for the points or parts of space, or the claim that reality, physical reality is fundamentally qualitative, is uh, still the best way forward um, in getting over the whole argument and, and the associated debates. And moreover, taking this position directs uh, our attention uh, in the debate between relationism and substantivalism uh, back to what really matters in the physics and, and away from uh, what I think are metaphysical distractions. Okay, good. Um, so what are these two strands in recent scholarship that I, that I was talking about? Um, here I'm following uh, things as they were laid out by um, Roberts and Wetherall in an introduction to um, a collected well, a special issue of Foundations of Physics that had just papers uh, uh, of recent work on the whole argument. And in their introduction, um, Wetherall and Roberts, sorry, uh, did I say Fletcher? Re Wetherall and Roberts distinguished the following two strands. First of all, there's a strand that basically um, involves rather technical philosophy of physics, heavy duty mathematics. And it tends to depart from a paper that was published by Wetherall in 2014 online and, and later in 2018 in print. Um, contributors to this strand can, uh, can several can be named, um, Sam Fletcher, uh, Roberts himself, Eric Curiel, uh, Manchak and Halverson, uh, John Dougherty. And I also want to mention Bellot with, a, with an asterisk, but Bellot's contribution I won't talk at all about today. He wrote an interesting paper called 50 million Elvis fans can't be wrong. And it's a paper that I would like to address uh, someday, but I won't talk about uh, Bellot in that paper today. So the trend in strand one of recent papers on the whole argument um, is to basically argue that the whole argument was always based on errors interpreting the mathematics. So these guys are not really getting heavily into um, analytic metaphysics um, and talking or, and we're talking about points as individuals with essences and things like that. Um, they're doing mathematical philosophy of physics. The other strand um, basically can be seen as metaphysics heavy works uh, following uh, in, a, in a tradition kicked off by a paper by Das Gupta in 2011. Uh, called The Bare Necessities. And some contributors to this strand of the literature would be uh, Russell, uh, Carolyn Brighouse, uh, Tre Trevor Title. Now, the trend in the strand two is to basically say that uh, the consensus view of how to respond to the, the whole argument, which is called sophisticated substantivalism, is unclear, confused, underdeveloped uh, or perhaps not developed at all, untenable, and most of all, in need of turning into a proper uh, account. And so there, according to this strand of the literature, there's a whole lot of work left to be done that people such as myself and Oliver Pooley um, and, uh, and Dave Baker and others have simply uh, shirked our, our, our work over the past decades. So, About strand one, I've read a few works. And now, um, really, what you're getting in this talk, uh, I hope, is a somewhat coherent discussion. But you're also seeing me um, play out my re-education into the philosophical literature of the whole argument 
in partial form, and I guess for that I should apologize. Um, I certainly haven't read every article that has come out in the 2000s about the whole argument. I'm not sure anybody could have done so. Um, so I'll be commenting on some papers that I've paid attention to. Now, among the papers in the, the mathematical strand of the literature, um, I decided to read a paper by Arledge and uh, Rhino from 2019, which offers an, a, a rebuttal of the arguments of Weatherall and Curiel and Sam Fletcher, uh, alleging that the whole argument was always based on a mistake. And I find the, the Arledge and Ranajewicz paper very, very uh, persuasive, um, but I have to admit that I haven't read everything in this strand of the literature, including the response that Weatherall has written uh, to them, so I should perhaps withhold judgment. Um, strand number two is really going to be where I focus much of my attention in this talk. So um, the authors in strand two seem unable to grasp uh, the more radical versions of sophisticated substantivalism um, offered by myself, by Oliver Pooley, and by uh, Dave Baker. And we'll see quotes illustrating how this plays out. From my perspective, um, these authors are caught in the web of two or more, perhaps, philosophical sins. Um, and also, I want to say that it's not just the metaphysical philosophers that are committing these sins, also the people on the mathematical side do so, people like Weatherall, Curiel, um, and also Arledge and Renazewitz um, are still committing the sins to some extent. Um, and I'll comment on that only very briefly. But what are these two sins? The first sin, in my view, is uh, taking the notion of a space or a space-time point as the metaphysically most fundamental idea for the articulation of absolutism or substantivalism about space-time. If you go back and look at um, Newton, Newton's own writings about uh, space or Leibniz or the Leibniz-Clark correspondence or, or many early discussions, you won't quite find the same almost uh, monothematic concentration on the notion of a space point or a space-time point that we see in the modern literature. And I think that uh, is a consequence or upshot of the whole argument and the, the kind of grip that it's had on the literature. I call it a, a philosophical sin um, because uh, points are, as my title, the title of my talk indicates, um, really just the, the, the limiting idea of uh, a part of space. And it's, it's not at all clear that you need to even talk about points in order to articulate um, substantivalism. Certainly, um, Newton himself didn't talk about points. The, uh, the mathematics with which we talk about uh, point manifolds today just simply didn't exist. <clears throat> but that didn't stop Newton from um, articulating a, a, an interesting uh, and in most respects, substantival viewpoint about space. Here's a quote from uh, Carolyn Brighouse's recent paper. Substantivalism is simply realism about space-time points or regions. Points or regions of space-time exist, not as logical constructions out of matter, but as entities in their own right. Now, one, one thing we see in this quote from Brickhouse is, uh, is a common feature of discussions in the literature, which is that lip service is paid to the idea that, well, we, we're really not presupposing that we're talking about points. Um, instead, we could say everything we want to say in terms of parts of space or regions. But in fact, nobody ever attempts to do this. And when the discussion gets down to brass tacks, everybody keeps referring back to individual points and what properties they're instantiating in different uh, metaphysical possibilities. And of course, the notion that uh, manifolds, uh, the, the, the idea that was first uh, pushed by Ehrman and Norton that the, the manifold M from general relativistic physics represents um, space-time, uh, goes hand in hand with the idea that M is a point set with topological structure, 
which is basically the, the usual interpretation of the 20th century mathematics with which we use, we describe general relativistic models. And um, so taking space-time as basically a set of individual objects with some topological structure um, is really the way the, the, the whole thing is articulated these days. Okay. Uh, what's the second sin? The second sin for me is taking too seriously the subject predicate structure that is built into everyday language and also 20th century formal logics, including um, first order predicate logic, first order modal logic, but which I think may not in the end really be reflective of the way physical reality is structured. But uh, a lot of contributions to the debates on the whole argument, uh, as we will see, presuppose that this can be taken for granted. So here's a quote from uh, Sam Fletcher. And remember, he's, he's, um, he's on the, the heavy math side of the, of the recent literature, not the metaphysics so much. A proponent of manifold substantivalism, roughly the view that the events of space-time have an existence independent of their material contents, must maintain that mg and mg uh, tilde, that's the shifted model, are distinct because in general, they assign different metrical values to points P that are members uh, of, of these models. Um, one thing that I just want to mention in passing, it's almost never commented, um, is that uh, actually points can't have uh, metrical values. Um, the metric field is a tensor. Uh, a tensor cannot be attributed, a tensor values cannot be attributed to a point. The only kind of field that can actually be straightforwardly attributed to a point on its own is a scalar field. Um, and what, what upshot that has for the debate is, is pretty much never discussed. Now, I think um, I need to, in order to not um, uh, completely destroy my time limit, I'm going to pass very quickly over the, what I, the remarks I have about the first strand of, of the recent literature. Um, what I do want to just point out, now don't read what's uh, on your screen in front of you. Uh, just look at the last two lines of the quote, uh, where uh, I'm quoting Weatherall saying, the reason for something is that there exist points P in the manifold at which uh, the metric values at P are not the same as the metric values in the shifted model at uh, psi of P, the, the shifted equivalent of P. All I want to show you with this quote from Weatherall is that uh, sin, sin number one, as I call it, is still being very much committed, um, just as it was in Nerman and Norton's paper. The focus here in the debates is all about points and allegedly the values that uh, things take at those points. Um, here is a quote that, um, that is the upshot, the essence of Renashowitz and uh, Arledge's response to Weatherall. Um, again, for reasons of time, I don't think I can go through this and explain it to you. But again, just look at the, at the bottom three lines and you can see that um, again, uh, the numerical identity of manifold points as the objects of predication is central to the response that they're offering. And um, essentially they're saying, but look, we have the manifold, it's a collection of points. We have no trouble referring to it uh, in, the two, uh, in the two possibilities, the, the initial model uh, and the whole shifted model of general relativity. So the Weatherall's argument trying to get us to, to think we can't make this reference um, doesn't work. So please forgive me for not explaining uh, this in any detail. My point was just to show you that um, the focus is very much definitely uh, here on points. And, um, and on and in terms of sin number two, um, Again, in Arledge and Renezewitz and in other 
papers from the uh, mathematical strand of this whole argument literature, we again find that basically um, they're taking points as subjects of predication and the, the field values at those points as uh, the properties we're attributing to them and just assuming that that's the right metaphysical way of, uh, of understanding reality. So they get into the, the problem of the whole argument and can't get out of it. Okay. Now, I'm going to skip this. Um, if in the question period, if desired, I can come back to uh, the way that Arlich and Renazewitz uh, tried to uh, avoid Wetherell's argument against uh, the whole argument even working. Because what they do is they say, well, Wetherell's response to the whole argument doesn't work. However, we have our own response, uh, which shows that the whole argument in determinism uh, actually doesn't work. But classical Leibniz shifting, where you simply take in classical space time everything and move it over in space by a set distance, um, that is something we can do. And, uh, and, and this is satisfactory to them because they do want to say that uh, there's, there is this uh, multiplication of different possibilities in classical physics, just as Newton and Clark, at least, uh, said there should be. But we don't have the whole argument problem that Ehrman and Norton came up with. And now, unfortunately, I don't think that their argument works, but uh, we won't have time, I suspect, to go into that today. OK. What I want to do now is move to the, the more metaphysical strand of, of recent literature. Um, and here, I think you'll see the, the two sins um, I, I'm talking about, the, the literature committing uh, more clearly and also as more sinful, at least I hope so. But first, I have to sketch um, what is this consensus view uh, that pretty much all the authors are taking to have been established in the 90s, um, but not to be tenable. And the consensus view uh, is called sophisticated substantibalism. Interestingly, uh, Bellot and Ehrman gave it that title uh, in a paper from the 1990s they wrote, wrote together, meaning it to be a pejorative. Um, but terminologically, I always thought that it was a bit of an own goal on their part, um, because it's not bad always to be sophisticated. Uh, and you'll see in what sense the, the term applies today. So sophisticated substantivalism, however, that this, this phrase has come to be applied to actually several different clusters of views with different people involved. Um, so sometimes Tim Maudlin is described as a sophisticated substantivalist. Um, his view originally was uh, put forward uh, one of the first responses to the whole argument. Um, and it's called uh, metrical essentialism, ME. Um, a different strand of responses was uh, kicked off by Jeremy Butterfield um, and uh, Carolyn Brighouse's works fall into this, uh, this camp and, and I'm sure some others. And they used counterpart theory uh, in Lewis's uh, framework to try to address the notion of indeterminism and the whole argument and argue that we could uh, avoid the, the uh, indeterminism. And then finally, there's the strand that, that, uh, that uh, Anna Maidens uh, kicked off. And then I was another early contributor to this and later Oliver Pooley, Dave Baker. So I'll refer to this as HPB. Um, and this strand is, um, what I take to be sophisticated substantivalism in its most radical form. Now, the core of all these views is to deny that uh, when we have a model MG and another shifted, supposedly shifted model MG tilde, to deny that these represent uh, distinct metaphysical possibilities. Say that there's some, there's some mistake being made if you think that you've got two different uh, metaphysical ways the world can be represented by these two different uh, mathematical structures. And therefore, um, since they're not distinct metaphysical possibilities, or at least not in a way that threatens indeterminism, uh, the whole argument can be blocked. 
So that's the common core of, of uh, sophisticated substantivalism. But the specific doctrines can be quite different. Um, OK. Now, sophisticated substantivalism of the form that I advocate, um, and also Oliver Pooley and Baker, um, agrees with this common core position. But the reason is that we say something like the following. Um, when you talk about uh, models that differ, like MG and MG tilde, the way that they are alleged to be different is in which um, space-time points have which metrical field properties or, or matter contents uh, occupying them. And so what this multiplication of alleged metaphysical possibilities amounts to is referring to space-time points as individuals and holding their individuality fixed and now creating a new metaphysical, a new metaphysical possibility where you say they have different possibility, different properties. And that is to presuppose that points are the kind of thing that have what I call primitive identity. That is something, some kind of uh, hexiotes is another word used in the literature, some sort of primitive thisness that allows us to talk about this thing and take it over into a different metaphysical world, a different metaphysical possibility where it has entirely different properties from what it had in the first world. And HPB authors simply claim we don't have to believe that there, that we that there is such a thing as primitive identity for space-time points or for anything else for that matter, um, and and that is what uh, grounds uh, our response to the whole argument. Uh, we deny that MG and MG tilde represent distinct metaphysical possibilities because the only way you can think of them as representing distinct possibilities is by ascribing primitive identity to space-time points that somehow transcends their qualitative features. And that we take to be a metaphysical uh, mistake, an unforced error. OK. Now, the more recent uh, contributors on the metaphysics side uh, claim that uh, metaphysical, sorry, metrical essentialism, that Tim Maudlin view, and uh, the BB view have serious drawbacks. I won't go into what those uh, drawbacks are. But moreover, they, they complain that uh, the HPB view, uh, which I just tried to describe to you, doesn't make any sense whatsoever. It just leaves them confused. Um, so uh, here, here now, now I have my slide that I wanted to show you explaining what sophisticated substantivalism, the way we think it should be done, uh, amounts to. And Pooley has um, emphasized this way of putting it. We can think of it as what you might call qualitativism. The fundamental description of physical reality is purely qualitative. Um, it doesn't need to mention individuals. My own uh, phrasing, as I already mentioned, is that we deny space-time points or anything uh, that it has primitive transworld identity, the kind of identity that can let us use it as a hanger to talk about uh, the same thing in different worlds when there are completely different um, properties assigned to that thing, but the two worlds are qualitatively exactly the same. So what we say is that uh, you may think you're describing a distinct possible world when you whole shift things over with respect to manifold points, but you're not. You're just representing the same metaphysical possibility using different labels. Therefore, there's no genuine, i.e. physical or metaphysical indeterminism in general relativity, at least not uh, from the whole argument. And, and there we thought was an end uh, on it. I also want to mention something uh, uh, as an aside. Um, if you find as the, as the talk goes on today that you're not, you're not at all sympathetic with sophisticated substantivalism, um, my first two papers about the whole argument argued that you can just live with the indeterminism and not worry about it. 
which is to say that um, Ehrman and Norton's original argument saying that, oh, we have this indeterminism, it's terrible, we can't allow that, um, can be resisted quite easily. Um, it's a kind of indeterminism that uh, we should never have been all that worked up about in the first place. But um, I won't say any more about that because literally nobody has responded to this, uh, this aspect of my, <laughs> of my work. Everybody seems to find the whole argument uh, superficially persuasive and looks for a way to get around it instead of living with it. Um, okay. So now what I offered uh, as the right way to think about space-time uh, without committing the, the philosophical sins um, is called metric field substantivalism. And I'm, one, re one reason I really like the Arledge and Reinajewitz paper is that they summarize my, my view extremely nicely and fairly. Um, so they say this, Carl argues that the representation of space-time is given entirely by the metric tensor and not the manifold plus metric, which is Maudlin's view. The role of the manifold is to give continuity and topological properties to the space-time that is expressed by the metrical field, but we should take the metric tensor to be representing the physically salient aspects of space-time. He calls this view metric field substantivalism. So uh, thank you, Rhino and Arledge, for, for putting it so nicely. The idea is, uh, yes, the, the manifold is something that we talk about in general relativity, what it's doing is codifying the, metric, the, the topological properties of the space-time that we're interested in. It's not giving you an infinitary collection of individuals that serve as the fundamental objects of predication um, in your description of reality. Okay, now I'm going to give you several tastes of what we find in, in the recent uh, literature on the metaphysics side. And what I want to point out before we dive in um, is that there's a, a typical pattern uh, that we find in, in the complaints that are made about sophisticated substantivalism, especially the HPV variety. And the pattern goes like this. A, uh, the author makes a, a claim that some widely accepted thesis is in fact hopelessly vague and unclear. And then B says, if anyone wishes to support it, um, they owe us a detailed new account that develops the allegedly vague ideas in ways that satisfy the author's strictures on what a proper account should look like. And so we'll see in, in detail two uh, instance of the instances of this pattern. I actually think that um, this is a pattern you can see in analytic philosophy quite frequently. It's not limited to this literature, um, but we'll see some examples of it shortly. So I'm going to start with uh, the paper by Das Gupta, The Bare Necessities from 2011. Das Gupta um, introduced to the whole argument literature the, the, the terminology of grounding, which is familiar from uh, the last 20 or so years of analytic metaphysics. In terms of grounding, the question is this, what grounds facts about the relations between bits of matter and space-time? Um, and then this answering this question leads to um, two types of substantivalism that Das Gupta wants to distinguish. Thin substantivalism says, well, um, the facts about the relations between bits of matter, the spatial and temporal relations between uh, physical things, are qualitatively grounded. And by contrast, the thick substantivalist says such facts are grounded in properties of individuals, namely, uh, as always, the points and regions of space-time possessing metrical field properties. And again, as always, uh, the, uh, the use of the phrase and regions is lip service here. When, when, when you get down to brass tacks, it's always the points that are at issue. And then what Das Gupta does is claim that thin substantivalism is woefully underdeveloped. Um, he says, we may start by noting out that thick, that of thick and thin substantivalism, thick substantivalism is surely the default substantival view. After all, it is overwhelmingly natural to suppose in general that qualitative facts are grounded in individualistic facts. And then he goes on, but the thin substantivalist does not have it easy. 
For suppose she proposes that all individualistic facts are grounded in facts expressible in PL, that's predicate logic without constants. You know, so in other words, um, Das Gupta talks about taking first order predicate logic and forgetting about using constants, just using bound variables. The trouble is that it is not clear what this could mean, for it is arguably analytic of the existential quantifier that existentially quantified facts are grounded in their instances. And here's what he says in the footnote to explain this. Specifically, if exists an X FX, then for any in individual A that is F, the fact that there exists an X that's F is grounded in the fact that A is F. So Dasgupta is offering uh, the following claim here. Um, what's metaphysically fundamental are individuals having properties. And any gen generic or gen general facts, such as the fact that there is some F in a world, has to be grounded on that kind of individualistic fact. Um, I was really taken aback when I read this uh, part of his paper. And specifically, I had trouble. Um, I wish I had my cursor to highlight. If you, if you look at the footnote sentence, it's, it's really quite odd from uh, the perspective of first order logic. Because inside the sentence, Das Gupta says for any individual A, so he seems to be quantifying over individuals in the context of talking about what um, a quantified expression like there is something that's F uh, means. And uh, so in, gen in general, I find it very difficult to know what, what he's trying to say here. Maybe what he's trying to say is that if it's a fact about a world that there is some X that's F, that there's some object that has the property F, then um, that fact about the world is grounded in each of the instances where we have an individual and the individual is F. These would be the metaphysically fundamental facts for Das Gupta. And here I just want to uh, note obviously that he's committing what I call sin two, um, taking the, the structure of first order predicate logic as the, the deep structure of physical reality. Going on, um, Das Gupta says, thin substantivalism so far is no more than the vaguest of hand gestures. I described it as the view that individualistic facts about the manifold are grounded qualitatively, but this says nothing about what kind of qualitative facts are taken to provide the ground. So before mo motivating her view, the thin substantivalist, and that would be someone like myself, must tell us what the view is. Specifically, she must clearly articulate what the underlying qualitative qualitative facts are like, and second, show that they are sufficient to explain, in the metaphysical sense, individualistic facts about the manifold. So uh, I just want to point out here, you can see that pattern I was um, talking about. Remember the pattern, um, which I'll repeat here. A, claim that some widely accepted view is hopelessly vague and unclear, and then B, says that if anyone wished to defend that view, they need to develop it in some very detailed, difficult way that, that satisfies the author's strictures. Okay, so now coming down to uh, my own view, Das Gupta says, for example, Hafer says that we should reject the ascription of primitive identity to space-time planes. Now, I'm not sure entirely sure what he means by this, and sometimes when clarifying the view, he seems to be proposing a bare modal thesis, such as anti-haxiatism but at other times he seems to have something like thin substantivalism in mind. If so, it is striking that he does not develop a positive theory of what the underlying qualitative facts, qualitative facts are like, and rests for the most part on negative claims, such as that quoted above. Um, namely, the claim that points don't have primitive identity. Similarly, Baker says that we should reject the possibility of hexiatistic facts. And by a hexiatistic fact, I take it that he means an individualistic fact without a qualitative ground. But again, this is a purely negative claim and not a positive theory of what the underlying qualitative facts are like. And now I have to um, mention something that's puzzling to me about the, the demand that's being put forward here. We're being asked to tell what the underlying qualitative 
facts are like. And that immediately makes me think, what do you mean what they're like? Do you mean what they are like qualitatively? Um, it's, it's hard for me to parse <laughs> exactly what the, the demand is here. But I guess what is clear enough is that uh, the demand is that we have to show how to reconstruct all the individualistic facts that the Hexiatist wants to talk about as being fundamental, um, starting from what we take to be fundamental, which is just the qualitative description of reality. Um, and Dasgupta thinks that uh, because that, that is a necessary task, um, we have really no idea what thin subsentitalists are saying until they, uh, until they give us uh, the positive theory. Uh, inst incidentally, in a footnote, he says, uh, of course, I'm being a little unfair here since both of these authors go on to expand on what I quoted above. <laughs> and that's right, actually, we do say um, quite a bit more about what we take the qualitative uh, features of reality uh, in terms of uh, models of general relativity to be like. But in any case, um, uh, let me take stock for a moment since time is, is rushing by quickly. What, what we've seen so far is that there's um, one author, but and I have all the slides to go through, which I won't go through for lack of time, uh, of another author, uh, Trevor Title, where we see that um, sophisticated subsentivalism or the, the, the so-called uh, consensus view is now described to be hopelessly vague and underdeveloped. And um, because the author believes that um, points are the primary uh, objects postulated by a, a substantivalist. They're the primary uh, metaphysical reality. And describing a metaphysical reality is to say what properties these points have as individuals. Um, the author finds it hard to understand what we could be saying when we say, uh, no, you don't have to think about general relativity that way. And in doing so, I think it's clear that they're committing what I, what I take to be the two philosophical sins. They are making points the, the primary object, and it's not clear why you need to do so. And they're taking the structure of first order logic to be the prima facie structure of reality. And if anybody wants to uh, describe reality somehow differently, they have to show how you reconstruct that description with using the language of first order predicate logic uh, and get everything that the author thinks you need to get. Okay, so I, as I said, for reasons of lack of time, I'm not going to go through the second example of these kind of metaphysical demands. Um, what I want to get to now is a different challenge. Hmm. Oh, yeah, here, let me, let me go ahead and give the metaphysical reply um, on behalf of the sophisticated substantivalism. What I want to say, and I'm pretty sure that um, philosophers like Pooley or, or Baker would agree with me, is that the pattern of these challenges uh, shows that the authors are in the grips of uh, these two sins, which I, I've been describing. We think that these challenges can simply be rejected. And general relativity can stand on its own two feet as giving itself a purely qualitative description of reality. And here I think um, it's important to, to reflect that um, when you learn general relativity, you're taught how to uh, describe uh, space times. You're, you're typically taught how to uh, start with a coordinate system and lay out some functions um, expressed in terms of those coordinates. And you're, uh, you're shown how those, those functions may represent matter existing at, at various locations and uh, the curvature of space and time having certain functional patterns and so forth. And all of that description presupposes that there is um, space time. I think in that sense, um, general relativity clearly presupposes a, a kind of a substantival take on space and time, but what it doesn't do is make a big deal out of the identities of the so-called point manifold. In fact, you cannot take your first course in general relativity without ever worrying about a point manifold 
for knowing what, what such a thing is. Um, and so from my perspective, it's not at all clear that, that general relativity taken uh, in its own terms doesn't give us a purely qualitative and acceptable description of reality. Moreover, the fact that, um, that physicists tend not to be uh, set on fire by the whole argument, and physicists in general tend to basically always say that uh, the two models, the, the first model of general relativity and the whole uh, shifted model are just representations of the same space-time, um, I think shows that, that there really isn't uh, a, a deep problem here waiting to be solved. Um, I would go on to say, um, and I think, again, Oliver Cooley at least would join me in this, all, all physical theories essentially give us a purely qualitative description of reality. And when we try to turn that into something that, that postulates a set of individuals with properties, that tends to be um, a philosophical gloss added to the theory afterward. But now I want to talk in the, my last few minutes about um, a challenge or a set of challenges that may make you think, well, um, this idea of denying primitive identity, this sophisticated substantivalism sounds neat. However, um, it's got an Achilles heel. There are clear thought experiments um, that show that it just isn't really a defensible view of, of reality after all. And we have to at least acknowledge enough individuality as part of the structure uh, of reality, um, enough to, to allow the, the whole argument to get going um, or, or various other problems to get going. Now, the first, <clears throat> the first instance of this kind of argument appealing to symmetry is familiar to, to us from a long time in the literature from way before the whole argument. Uh, and this is the, the thought example of uh, Black's uh, two iron spheres. So we just imagine a world in which there nothing exists except two qualitatively identical iron spheres set some distance apart from each other. And now the idea is that if we don't have, um, the, the idea of this initial challenge is that if you want to be a sophisticated substantivalist, then all you have when you describe your reality is you can say that such and such properties are instantiated, but you don't have the tools that you need to describe a, a world like the world of black spheres because all you, all you can say qualitatively about this world is that the property of uh, uh, ironness and sphericality, et cetera, et cetera, blackness is, are, uh, these properties are instantiated. But how are you going to say that they are instantiated twice without talking about the different places um, at which these different, these properties are instantiated. And for that, you need uh, the different parts of space, uh, which you have to be able to name in order to get this going. So that's the first uh, way that the, the challenge may get articulated. Um, and actually, I responded to this in my uh, 1996 paper. The, the answer to this challenge, insofar as it's a challenge, is to say, well, no, uh, there's a further part of the qualitative description of reality, which is that there are two spheres. That's all you have to say. And then you've got the difference between the, the black world with two spheres and a different world that has only one sphere. So I don't see a, a deep challenge here, but now, and this is where most philosophers jump off of my bus, um, the thought experiment can be uh, developed in the following way. So we have um, a world that starts out with just two black uh, iron spheres, and this world is indeterministic. And at some point, one of the spheres just keeps on existing. And at that uh, point, some point in time, uh, one of the spheres explodes. Okay. Now, um, The thought experiment goes like this. Um, if you imagine a symmetric world, and all the, the essence of the black sphere example is just that we have a world 
um, in which we have two regions that are qualitatively identical to each other. So it doesn't matter, it doesn't have to be an iron sphere. These things could be planets full of people living on them, in, in particular people like yourselves. Now imagine that you're actually living on uh, one of these two planets and you know, separated uh, from space in you, there's uh, an exact duplicate of you living on the other sphere. Um, maybe it's set so far away that you don't see or know about this person, it doesn't matter. Now, um, here's the possibility we were talking about. One of the two spheres explodes. Now, surely if you are living on one of these spheres, it matters to you whether the sphere that explodes is the one that you're on or the other guy that looks just like you. And so the thought experiment goes that um, you, if you have feel any intuitive pull for this argument, you have to acknowledge that there are actually two possibilities of symmetry breaking here. There's the possibility where the left sphere is the one that explodes, and there's the possibility where the right sphere is the one that explodes. But if you are a sophisticated substantivalist of my stripe, there's no way to acknowledge these two possibilities because qualitatively speaking, they're the same possible world. Um, and here's another um, symmetry breaking uh, challenge. Uh, this is based on an, a thought experiment originally from Mark Wilson. Um, we imagine uh, uh, in a kind of a Newtonian physics, we have a rod uh, of some solid material and a very heavy ball sitting on top of the rod. And uh, as it happens, the ball is too heavy for the structural uh, stability of the, the material making up the rod. Um, so with this crushing weight, what happens at some point is that the, the rod buckles, as you would expect it to happen. And of course, it has to buckle in some particular direction. So the challenge um, is that these examples can only be described using language that commits us to individuals across modal contexts. So if you think, for example, that the, 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 the rod buckles in this direction, but obviously that was indeterministic. It happened to go in this direction, but it could have gone in the other direction. Or even if you just um, notice that having distinguished the direction in which it buckles, we can now talk about the possibility in which it was the opposite direction in which it buckled. If we acknowledge these possibilities, then we're committed to holding on to the identity of parts or, or, or regions of space across modal contexts, the direction in which the tower buckles or which of the two spheres explodes and so forth. Um, but if you buy these ex thought experiments, then um, the sophisticated substantivalist denial of primitive identity is, is not sustainable. We, we have to uh, use some other way of responding to the whole argument. And that's why um, many philosophers don't go along with uh, the us radicals. Um, so Tim Maudlin, uh, for example, or Butterfield or Brighouse, uh, they all take a different approach to denying the two different whole argument worlds. And those, um, those approaches involve essentialism or David Lewis's counterpart theory or what has come to be called in recent works cheap anti hixietism or, or, and so forth. I won't talk about what those strategies are, but these are strategies that let all these authors acknowledge these distinct possibilities we were just talking about with these thought experiments, which um, the hardcore sophisticated substantivalist like me cannot talk about. And so here I go. Here's the sophisticated response to these uh, examples. Is not so. Just flat-footedly, uh, we don't have to acknowledge these as multiple possibilities. Um, in other words, what I want to say is that this is a bullet that we have to bite, and it's a bullet that can be comfortably bitten and chewed. What is the bullet? Um, in all these worlds that we were talking about, the, the world where one of the spheres explodes, the world in which the tower buckles in some direction, etc., et exactly 
one possibility, one metaphysical possibility is being depicted, not multiple. We ourselves using language have two or more ways of depicting that metaphysical possibility. That much is true. We have these multiple models that we can give and we could do it in like the whole argument way or we could um, do it by labeling directions on the diagram where we show the tower. We can put uh, <clears throat> a label one on the left sphere and a label two on the right sphere and so forth. But these are just linguistic things that we do, putting tags onto the parts of a metaphysical possibility. Again, if you don't think, if you don't want to commit sin two, if you don't think that first order predicate logic with individual constants is the deep metaphysical structure of reality, you don't have to agree that the fact that we have these ways of labeling or talking about possibilities means that there are genuinely multiple possibilities. There's just one metaphysical possibility in these cases that we're talking about. Um, so ultimately what I wanna say is that um, you can see in the continuing whole argument literature in these examples of symmetry breaking uh, and in a whole bunch of other areas of philosophy, it is easy to commit the two sins that I laid out for you today. But also, I, I think it's also not that hard to stop sinning uh, once you've seen the light. And so that's really where I want to stop. I have a, a slide to talk about how this relates to material substances instead of the parts of space time. But let's, let's skip that uh, because it's getting late. My conclusions, what I want to defend today, uh, full-blown anti-hexiotism, um, the strongest or more radical sophisticated substantivalism, um, I think is still the best way for forward in approaching the metaphysics of substantivalism in general relativity, not just for responding to the whole argument, but just the best way to think about how we represent substantival space-time. By, by directing us towards how physics describes the world qualitatively, um, I think that sophisticated substantivalism directs the, the, the debate about substantivalism versus relationism back to the stuff that the physicists really talk about. And that is, uh, that's a good thing. So if space or space-time is as general relativity des describes it using the metric field with its topological structure, the question is really, does this amount to something similar to classical Newtonian absolute or substantival space and time or not? Can space-time so described exist without matter in it? This is what was important to Leibniz or Newton. Can its features somehow, can the features of uh, the general relativistic description of space-time somehow be reduced to facts about matter and its behavior? That's the perennially attractive idea that Ernst Mach had. Um, these are questions that, that we can come back to talking about if we stop talking about space-time points as individuals, uh, uh, as the bearers of properties, uh, as if that was the, fine, the, the, the most interesting way of describing the spatio-temporal structure of reality. So my conclusion is that philosophy of physics uh, would do well to contemplate its sins and going forward attempt to sin no more. Thanks for listening. So let's start with uh, Tomasz. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Carl, for this wonderful talk. I have to admit, I share the, the, the majority of your views, especially regarding sophisticated substantivalism. However, I have several comments and questions, and perhaps I will have to limit myself <laughs> just to let other people ask their questions. So let me start with a comment uh, regarding uh, sin number one, number two, sin, the sin related to the uh, to to. The first, the first order logic and the subject uh, uh, predicate uh, uh, statement. So I think that uh, as far as uh, uh, Dasgupta is concerned, I think he may be absolved of this committing the sin because of his paper. I don't know if you're familiar with his paper of uh, 2009 
in which he presents like a formal, he proposes a formal theory, um, sort of like a non-standard uh, metaphysical theory uh, of, of, of um, sort of qualitative predicates without individuals whatsoever. So he gets rid of all individuals. So I think, that, I mean, like he's basically like in your camp with respect to, to his, his objections to the idea of primitive sort of individuals as, as sort of like separate, as a separate category of objects. He, he wants to get rid of them altogether. So that's one, one, one comment. But if I may, I, I would like to also ask you a question regarding this uh, sin number one, uh, uh, regarding the notion of, of uh, individuals generally and, and, and uh, uh, spatial temporal points in particular. Uh, uh, first of all, I, I, I don't think that I exactly understood what you had in mind when you said that uh, whereas you can associate attribute scalars to points, you cannot do this with respect to vectors and tensors. Is this uh, is what you have in mind related to the problem of sort of like uh, limit properties or like uh, uh, derivative properties that kind of like they, they, they tell us something about the infinitesimal uh, sort of uh, uh, region rather than specifically points. This yes, kind of like takes us, is that yeah. what you had in mind? Okay, this, this takes us back sort of like to this debate between Frank Arsenius and Sheldon Smith regarding like, you know, uh, uh, instantaneous velocities, whether they are attached to points. So my, so my understanding is that you would follow the idea that they're not specifically attached to points, but rather to, to, to sort of like infinitesimal uh, 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 regions. Okay, uh, so that, that was kind of like a clarificatory question, but, but still I have some problems uh, with your general attitude that you would like to totally sort of like abandon the concept of, of, of spatial temporal points, because uh, if that's uh, uh, what you would like to do, uh, how can we sort of like represent the fundamental notions of like, you know, uh, maps on manifolds, uh, you know, the feomorphisms, which are kind of like, you know, uh, maps from points to, po I mean, from points to points. I mean, can you, can you sort of replace this talk with um, some form of, uh, I don't know, mappings between what regions or, or I'm, 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 I'm not exactly sure, uh, I mean, how you would like to proceed with this standard formal, uh, formal uh, uh, tools. So, so I, I guess that that would be all for now. Maybe I will go back to the end of the line and then ask some further questions after others have their chance. Okay, thank you. Thank, thanks, Thomas. That's um, very helpful. Um, I, I should, I guess, I should look at the Das Gupta's two thousand nine uh, paper. The reason I thought that um, he can be fairly accused of committing the sin. Um, was shown in, in that um, quote from a footnote where he talked about how um, a qualitative fact like uh, there is an F um, has to be grounded on uh, facts like FA, which where A is a in, uh, specific individual. I think, I think you're right that he wants to go in the direction of a sophisticated substantivalist position and think of reality as um, fundamentally qualitative but I think that because he's um, uh, in the grips of sin two, at least on a prima facie level, he, he thinks that, that a whole lot of work has to be done to make that uh, more than just a promissory note or a vague hand waving. And that's what I, what I would like to dispute. Um, when it comes to um, doing without points, um, I, I guess I shouldn't um, I don't want to be understood as saying that we should just get rid of points entirely, stop talking about them, stop, uh, stop doing transformations and so forth. Having said that, um, there's something that I would love for um, a much better philosopher of general relativity than me to get to the bottom of, someone like Brian here, um, which would be exactly what is the difference between um, doing everything passively in general relativity, just using coordinates to talk about places and, and, and the, the so-called active treatments, the intrinsic uh, geometric formulations, and exactly what can we not do um, if we, as it were, try to do as little as possible in the active mode, in the, in the, uh, in the and, and, and I'd be interested in knowing what the limitations are there. I mean, certainly for doing an awful lot of uh, presenting different kinds of space-time and talking about their structure and so forth, 
the individuality of points you know, doesn't, doesn't play a role. And that's why physicists, whether they're more comfortable working in coordinates or more comfortable using the intrinsic um, uh, formulation of, of, of the maths, um, all agree that the diffeomorphic models should be taken as representing the same physical situation. Okay, thank you very much. That, that, that's really helpful. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, next in line, we have uh, Anno. Thanks, Antonio. Thanks very much, Carl. Um, I, generally, I'm uh, on your side, although I don't have a kind of formed position on these uh, things. Um, so I'd like to ask, what do you do with the following cases? Not as an objection, perhaps you have a straightforward uh, answer, just because I'm not sure what to do with them. Um, for instance, if you take um, Black's two uh, spheres and you rotate them like this, or you rotate only one of them, um, if you don't distinguish the points on the sphere, how can you say this one uh, doesn't move and this one is rotating? Or if you take your uh, rod and you, you, know, you press it and it bends, and then it starts turning like this, right? Around itself. So we you know the, the points on the outside go inside and, and vice versa. If you don't distinguish these points, how can you say it's uh, turning around itself? So that's my uh, puzzle. Right. Uh, these are good questions. And um, the, the first example you give with uh, uh, one of the spheres rotating reminds me of something that David Lewis discussed. Um, it was a challenge put to him by um, Sally uh, Haslinger, I think. Um, it, it depends on what the, the representation of physical matter is like, but of course, in, in any theory that's physically realistic, when, when a sphere is rotating, there's all sorts of internal stresses and strains and, um, and just having you made a, a logical uh, point, not a physical point. Well, but um, if we get into um, the, the metaphysical sphere of theories in which we've just got a continuum, um, then I'm not sure that I have firm intuitions about whether it makes sense to say that a thing can be rotating or not if there's no qualitative difference between a rotating sphere and a, and a non-rotating sphere. It depends on how you develop the physics of it and how the physics licenses counterfactuals about what would happen if you did something something different. Um, so that's about the rotating sphere, about the about the tower. Um, that's uh, buckling. Can you repeat the, uh, the the worry you had there? Yes, uh, but also about the spheres. When you first answered uh, black, you didn't refer at all to physics. To the contingencies of physics, and now you uh, feel pressure to go there. So if you go there, you can say Black's uh, world is impossible to begin with, but you don't want you didn't want to say that. So why did you? What justifies introducing the distinction at this stage? And with well, the Black's, Black's no, if even in general relativity, Black's world is not uh, is not physically impossible. Um, now the rotating. Um, your introduction of rotation may change things there, but just the simple uh, two spheres sitting at a certain distance from each other, um, no, no problem with that. Um, and, and in, the road, in, yeah, the, the road. You, you'll give a similar answer to that. So you know, I, I took the rod, and I simply turn it like that. And if, even if you bend it, you know, it's, uh, it turns like that. Um, so uh, uh, the points that were outside and not uh, squeezed now move to the inside and get uh, So probably we'll say there's a physical difference there. Well, I mean, um, think, think about if the, the tower is uh, buckling and it twists as well as buckling. Now, one thing that I thought you might be doing is raising the challenge of chirality <laughs> here, um, because you can imagine the, the uh, at least most people's intuitions tell them, you can imagine the, the rod uh, twisting in a left-handed manner or twisting in a right-handed manner, and those are surely different. But in order to describe what the difference is, um, a, qual a purely qualitative uh, description doesn't suffice. 
because the left, left or like the right hand rule that we use in, in physics um, essentially points in directions in space time to establish the chirality um, uh, of left versus right. And I, hope, I wrote a paper uh, about that in 1998 where I bit that bullet as hard as it can be bitten and said, no, um, for a proper uh, relationist or sophisticated substantivalist, there really is just um, one metaphysical possibility here. So that's how I would... I, yeah. I, 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 with this, I'm happy, actually. I told you I'm uh, on your side, generally. But just when, when it turns around, I mean, that's why I wanted it to buckle. If uh, you say uh, a rod which turns around in empty space is impossible, completely symmetric, doesn't make sense, that's fine with me. But if you buckle it and uh, it turns like this seems to make sense, but for that, you have to distinguish between the parts. But I think I think that your, your idea is, is very commonsensical. Uh, the, the rod is made up of, say, atoms, and the, there's a difference between the atoms that are uh, on the side that buckles and the uh, atoms on the other side. And, and so we can talk about this other possibility where the atoms that are on the outside um, had instead been on the side that is buckling inward. It seems like that makes sense, but what we're doing is um, introducing labels onto things that don't have primitive identity, according to me. So neither space-time points nor atoms, uh, nor fields, nor anything else physical, um, has the kind of um, axiety that, that really lets it be sensible, according to me, um, to say that there's two different worlds where, you know, the one where the atom, call it A, atom A, is on the outside of the buckling or, or whether it's on the inside of the buckling. Um, these are, we're just fooling ourselves into thinking we're describing two different possibilities here. Okay, um, Sam, it's your turn. Great, thanks, Carl. My, my question follows up from this discussion, but it uses a different sort of example. It's indeed about why we should think of isometric models in GR or isomorphic models more generally in any scientific theory as representing the one same possibility. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's like, it's a coherent position, but it doesn't seem to me that it fits with scientific practice. Um, so like you might remember from my paper, I had the example of Schwarzschild space times. The plural here is um, uh, a bit of a uh, uh, plural by courtesy because in a sense, well, in a literal sense, all of the Schwarzschild space times are all isometric with one another. So uh, nonetheless, we would like to think that it's possible that you could have black hole space times of this sort that have different masses. Some of them represent supermassive black holes, other represent black holes of moderate masses. But, and of course, folks talk about that um, all the time. These models represent these different black holes. But according to right, the story, they don't know what they're talking about, right? They're, these okay. astrophysicists are confused because all of these models represent the same space time, right? No, no. Um, what I want to say is that um, when you've given the complete qualitative description of a world, you've given the complete description. That doesn't necessarily mean that uh, isometric space times in every kind of context or th physical theoretical context have to be taken to be presenting the exact same model. So, so I, I realize that there can be isometries between any two um, quote unquote different uh, Schwarzschild solutions with different M's. And then if you want to have your different worlds, which I think it's perfectly uh, legitimate to want to have, then you have to say, well, look, there's, um, there, there's a feature here which is sort of um, not just encoded in certain metrical properties of the space-time, but it's also, um, it's essentially built into the way we would represent different models, um, say using um, 
a coordinate representation of the Schwarzschild solution with uh, uh, m different m values. And of course, we, the fact that we can mathematically translate one of those into the other um, doesn't mean that our original intention has to be swept aside. Our original intention was to use the coordinates in a quasi-meaningful um, way and representing features about what we take to be um, the mass of the central um, black hole. And, and the fact that the resources, um, when you if you identify everything that's isometric, you, you lose a, a representative, representative capacity doesn't go against the, what I take to be the, the spirit of sophisticated uh, self-survivalism. Right. Does that make sense? It does. Do you think that the same response though could be given for the spheres or for the buckling beam and so on? Just to be clear, um, I'm not saying that the position you know that you're advocating is is incoherent. I think it's completely coherent. It just seems to me that this other position is also coherent mm -hmm. as well. Um, and it has it, we could debate about the advantages of the two, but do you think that the same sort of position could be taken about the spheres and the buckling beam and so on? Um, I think that the same, I mean, one can one can react to those cases by saying, look, uh, I just think there's multiple possibilities here and I'm going to design my um, my way of talking about physical nature in a way that lets me capture these distinctions. I, I, I don't deny that that can be done. The, the question was whether it's even um, defensible to take the opposite uh, attack, which I take, try to say, no, all of these things are, are as one. Now, what, what dif what's different with the, um, the black hole example that you, that you gave compared to the buckling tower is that um, what I was trying to say is that uh, we've got a feature that's meant to be qualitatively different between these two models, despite the isometry that exists, namely the size of the black hole. That has a kind of a meaning in wider applications of physics, like the, the ones that the astrophysicists use, um, which doesn't presuppose ascribing primitive identity to individuals. It's just a further qualitative description of reality that, as it were, goes off the page of what GR is giving us in, in a mathematical description. Not, you can't say the same thing about the direction of the buckling of the tower. There, I think that all you're doing is, talk, is labeling an individual and saying, oh, it's this one instead of that one, where those individuals are, at the beginning of the story, qualitatively identical. So that's what, where I would see a difference between the cases. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure. I see the difference yet, but we could maybe talk about it at another juncture. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Joanna. Uh, thank you. Um, I want to make a suggestion uh, concerning what might be the idea behind what you call two scenes, and ask you what do you think about this. Uh, so <clears throat> this idea might be expressed by saying that our best guide to the ontology of physical reality are our best scientific theories. Uh, and as a consequence, um, the default uh, position is to take them at face value. And if one doesn't believe that in some respects, uh, the formalism of our best theories um, doesn't capture the structure of reality correctly, then such a person is committed to provide a reformulation uh, of a given theory, such that these parts of the formalism that that person thinks don't have counterparts in reality, don't appear in this reformulation. For example, if someone believes that there are no points or no individuals, then such a person should provide a framework, uh, meaning the reformula a reformulation of that original theory uh, in which it is possible to express all the facts that were expressible in the original theory, but without ever mentioning points or individuals. And um, then uh, if there is no structural formulation, 
the most reasonable ontological stance would be just to um, take this original formalism at the face value because we don't have like um, any better sources of information concerning the ontology of the reality, so to say. So well, that's, uh, I think, an excellent way of representing the what what leads to the Ehrman and Norton whole argument in the first place, and to it's a, it's also behind um, a, a rather straightforward scientific realist approach to interpreting physical theories. Um, <clears throat> let me just make a couple of remarks. One is that um, uh, Ehrman presents himself as essentially following Quine's dictum. And I think that that's visible in this, the, the way you sketch things out. Oh, just take our best theories, see what they quantify over. And then that's what you're committed to. And the quantification could be uh, over properties and over individuals and stuff like that. What I object to there is that Quine himself, although he was kind of anti-metaphysical in some ways, is committing um, sin number two there because he's basically using this word quantification, which comes from um, first order logic and, and first and second order logic. And the idea is, well, re-regiment the, the theory in a way that it fits these, this logical structure that we find, which is basically a formalization of everyday language. And then you'll see what the theory really commits you to. I, I've never bought that. I've never found that Quine dictum at all plausible. Um, I'm more on the side of uh, von Frossen, who said in, in his... 93 book, I think it was, that the physical theories don't wear their interpretations on their sleeve. You've got a theory, it's, it's got its mathematical apparatus, usually it's got many mathematical apparatuses, as many as different physicists who work with it. Um, it's not clear what the interpretation is, it takes work to, to look at that theory and work out what is it telling me about the nature of reality. And so, so my, my plea would be that um, uh, in that working out, um, one of the things that it's plausible to do is, is question whether the, the role of the point manifold is exactly uh, the role that these authors are taking it to be, which is giving the primary objects that exist and giving you a set of individuals that are hangers for properties. And, and that's what I think uh, we, we can try to resist. But I agree with the, you laid out beautifully, clearly, um, the, the path of reasoning that leads you to the, the standard picture that leads to the whole argument. Okay, thank you. Uh, next in line, we have Mauro. Please go yes. ahead, Mauro. Thank you, Carl, for your nice thought-provoking uh, talk. I, I'm trying to be even more skeptical than you here. Uh, do you think that the dispute between subfundivalism and relationships is still uh, valid or at least applicable in general relativity? Because the problem here is who should be playing the role of space or substance, so to speak? Should you be subfundivalism about manifold because the metric field is a physical thing? or you should be substantivalist about the metric field. And you can see reasons for both choices. And in fact, Ehrman and Norton said, no, no, you have to be substantivalist about the manifold. But on the other hand, the metric field uh, is something that gives you spatial temporal distances, but it is physical. So you don't have any difference between uh, something that is contained and something that is a pure container. So you either identify space time with the metric field, or you claim like Einstein did once, I think that space time is the structural quality of the field. So you have the metric field, which is a physical field, and then you have spatial temporal relations among region of the field. Good, good question. Um, as you may know, um, this is something I discussed uh, in my paper my big paper on the whole argument in some yeah. depth. I, I, I don't agree with Ehrman and Norton's choice there. And, and this is an illustration of how um, you can't take the interpretation of, uh, of a theory on, um, to be straightforward um, 
on its wearing it on its sleeve, so to speak, because um, I do think that there's a stronger case to be made that the structure that more clearly corresponds to classical absolute space and plays a, a similar set of roles in general relativity would be either the metric field itself or the metric field plus the manifold, the way that Maudlin said. Um, and that's because um, if you just imagine a bare manifold on its own, um, we don't even have a distinction between spatial and temporal directions yeah, I agree, of course. and so forth. So you know these arguments. And um, um, but having uh, having then put the focus onto the metric field as the primary representer of, um, of space time, I, I think that one can try to reconstruct uh, something similar to an absolutist versus relational debate. Um, it's not one that the relationist looks likely to win in, in, in current physics, but, but one can try to reconstruct the debate in those terms. Uh, can I ask how, uh, maybe I should do it later because I no, should uh, like How you. can you read? I know that, I mean, I read your paper a long time ago, but how can you reconstruct the bait once you see, or once you recognize that it's not clear cut the distinction between well, what is substance and what is relation there? Right, so I, I, I don't think that there's any plausible case to be made for the metric field as part of the contained in yes. space time. Instead, it's it's part of the representation of the container. And when we think about space or space time in this using this um, classical container metaphor, because um, the metric field gives you um, the the all the spatial distance temporal. relations and and uh, temporal relations and so forth that define the where. <laughs> when you want to talk about where things are. You've got to have a metric on that manifold, otherwise you, you can't say anything other than occupation of individual points, which which is to go in a sinful direction. So, so once you've identified the metric, um, the fact that it is dynamical uh, doesn't mean that it's any less substantial, in my view, quite the opposite. The fact that it may, in some models, be said to contain uh, stress energy, okay, if that's defensible. Um, um, then it makes it all the more substantial. And so these, I'd, I'd never found it persuasive what Ehrman and Norton say that, that uh, if we don't take the manifold as space time, we don't know how to distinguish between container and contained. The contained is uh, whatever the material stuff is that we talk about in our quantum theories or classical electrodynamics or whatever, um, that then gets somehow translated into uh, the stress energy tensor in the in the rather simple representations of general relativity but that that physics is left off stage but but the, the metric field is giving us the container no i agree thanks uh brian thank you uh, great talk carl um thanks for the shout outs about uh, passive transformations um i think uh I wonder if you had enough time to say more about the, uh, the, the mathematical side of the literature, if you would recognize a more agreement between uh, uh, yourself and uh, Jim Weatherall than you may be hinted at in this brief presentation. So, I mean, a couple of things he says that I've uh, found congenial are pointing out the curious fact that nobody uh, was puzzled by the whole argument for 60 years, uh, sort of inviting one to wonder why that is, you know, what happened, the argument come back, and his uh, conclusion somewhere that the passive way is really the right way to think. And that's, you know, J Jim's not the sort of person who would have that sort of you know, default towards uh, classical geometry. So um, is there, may do you see maybe realms of overlap between your view and Jim's that you would not see between uh, with the, the other mathematical uh, people, if you will? Um, yeah, I, I suspect that that's exactly right. In fact, I had a remark um, on one of the slides that I breezed past without showing you um, that, I, that, I, that hypothesizes that he's really thinking along somewhat similar lines to me, but he's still digging into um, the the language of points and and uh, and, and 
using all that apparatus and trying to then argue uh, a way of saying, no, there, were, there weren't two models, there weren't two representations of the world here after all. It's different from my way, but I think you're right that there's a strong um, kinship there. Now, you know, true confessions uh, that I, I made some at the beginning saying that I haven't read all the papers. Um, I also, the ones I have read, I haven't read them all in the last week. And, and so Weatherall's paper I read several years ago, and I'm probably um, uh, having a forgetting about some of the features of, of Weatherall's overall position by the fact of really just having re-encountered his view in the context of Varlage and Renazhowitz's discussion most recently, and that's what's fresh in my mind. But thanks for that. Um, um, and I'll have another uh, look at, at what he's doing there. I also want to read his response to uh, our legend, Ryan Aswitz. Great, thanks. Thanks. So we're back to Tomas. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, if I may uh, go back to this, uh, the, the problem of, of uh, symmetry break in determinism. Uh, I, I have to admit that I, I'm very sympathetic to your solution, which is essentially that you're denying that you have, we have more than one um, options or possibilities of, of, of evolution, that there's only one evolution because there's only one sort of qualitative description of the, the situation. So I am very sympathetic to that. However, I think that there's a very serious challenge to this view, and I would like, would like to know what your opinion on this challenge could be. The challenge is as follows. Suppose that we have two black spheres which are not exactly indiscernible, but almost indiscernible. So there's like a tiny, almost imperceptible difference between these two spheres. For instance, one has mass M, the other one has mass M plus some delta, which delta is so, so tiny that you cannot even see it. Nevertheless, it's still there. So in this situation, of course, there will be a qualitative difference between the two evolutions that, you know, one evolution in which uh, the, 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 the sphere of mass M explodes and the other when the, the sphere of the other mass explodes. But now if you just go sort of like with the tiny uh, difference to zero, then out of a sudden from two evolutions, you get one. So there's like a jump. And I, it strikes me as, as, as very, very sort of, uh, you know, controversial that you can make, make you know, there's some sort of like discontinuity here. Okay, so how, how, how come then that an infinitesimal difference can, you know, in, 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 in the, in, in the uh, indiscernibility or discernibility between objects can, can, can uh, sort of result in a, in a huge sort of like, you know, zero one difference between, between the number of, of, of of options or possibilities. That's a, that's good. That's another um, good intuition pulling argument. Um, but but here's here's my attempt to pull you back in the other direction. Um, one way of thinking about anti hexiotism is uh, is to say that there's no difference between worlds without a qualitative difference. Now, when I just utter that. It sounds like it might be something that you could think plausible, at least until you start thinking about uh, cases where you put yourself living on a sphere uh, and stuff like that. So no, the principle is then there's no distinction between metaphysically possible worlds without a qualitative distinction, or another way to put it, reality, reality is fundamentally qualitative at bottom. And so with, with this series of ever more subtly different um, uh, pairs of spheres, as long as you uh, continue to have a qualitative difference between the two spheres, you've got a world that is qualitatively vastly uh, different from a perfect black sphere world. And it, in that sense, it's not so, um, it's, it's not so surprising that, um, that you get uh, this sudden jump. To just one possibility. It's just consistently following out this uh, this this principle. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. Thank you. Sam, I was hoping we could explore a little bit more why you think thread one commits sin one. Uh -huh. uh, so you seem to hint, Carl, that it has to do with statements that people make where people make reference to space-time points. But I, I couldn't quite see what that has to do with 
the sin for the very reasons that you were describing about why you reject Quine's ontological dictum. Just because we mention something or quantify something over it in our theoretical descriptions and models doesn't mean that we're making in any specific metaphysical commitment to them. But I think I'm just not, I didn't, uh, I, I didn't just pull everything together. So I was hoping I could just invite you to say a little bit more about yeah. why, I, I, why you think that. Yeah, one thing I should say is that um, the sense in which um, um, people in the mathematical side are, are committing sin one is no different from the, the sense in which Ehrman and Norton did by setting up the argument in the first place. Um, it's exactly the same thing, which is to say, um, it's taking um, points uh, with, with identity um, to be the most fundamental uh, objects of predication. And now, why I see that still happening anytime that you've got uh, on the on the technical side of the literature, anytime you still are worrying about it, um, two of these models related by a whole transformation as being uh, a threat of indeterminism, is then then you're ascribing a kind of importance to the identity of points and what qualitative um, properties those identity bearing points happen to instantiate in a world. Um, that, that, that is pushing you all the way to thinking of these, this as some sort of physical indeterminism. And, and that's where, where I would see sin one continuing to be committed. Whereas if, if you were going in the direction of just saying, look, um, um, yeah, we can do active transformations, we can make a whole thing, but you know, at the end of the day, then we have to do our interpretation. And my interpretation is that these are not presenting uh, two different physical possibilities in a way that amounts to indeterminism in a sense that I would ever care about. If somebody says that, then they're, they're not as much committing sin one. Did, did that help with? Well, well, it does, but it seems that that's, that thread ends in the very place that you said that you wanted people to end up in. So, so I'm confused where the sin is being committed if the avoidance of the sin leads to the very place that the thread ends. I wonder if it has to do with the following. So like in some of the quotations that you're giving, it's where folks are like describing kind of like what the state of play is and they're trying to imitate the language to try to remind people, by the way, this is what we're talking about. Remember this stuff. Um, and I wonder whether or not the fact that it's occurring in that context has something to do with the fact that um, uh, that sort of language is is invoked there. Maybe, uh, maybe so. Maybe so. When it comes to people like um, yourself or Weatherall, that 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 could well be. Um, and so, as I said, the the paper I have most uh, fresh in my mind is Arledge and Renazwitz. And what I had to skip past um, for reasons of time is um, showing that what they do is is committing um, the sin because they basically say, look. Um, what matters is whether you can refer to these uh, space-time points. And so then they, they make a kind of an argument, which isn't really very clearly laid out at the end of their paper, but the argument is meant to be something like this. Um, imagine now that we've got uh, two models representing the actual past um, uh, is exactly the same. Um, we need to, if we want to talk about how those things develop in the future, so as to lay out the alleged two possibilities in the whole argument, uh, we need to somehow establish how coordinates refer to points. And then they talk about how physically that's, uh, that's done and say, but look, the physical procedure um, turns out to be exactly the same procedurally um, in the two cases. And therefore, there is no way of establishing the reference to points in the future in a way that it would allow us to talk about um, the, these two models as being physically distinct. Well, that's the, the way I interpret their, their, their shtick. Um, and then, but it's just as it were a failure of our ability to uh, use the tools of reference to grab hold of these individuals. It's not so much that they don't believe the individuals are, are, are robustly uh, there and important because then they, they say, okay, but now, Go back to classical physics. Um, we want to say that a Leibniz shifted world is absolutely a different world, and there they don't have any trouble getting hold of the points 
in the classical space, um, uh, space time by the referential kinds of um, techniques that Maudlin talked about all those years ago. So, so I think that at least these two guys um, are still involved in scene one. Maybe you're, maybe not, uh, maybe not in the end. Some other commentators like uh, like Jim. Yeah, I, I I think I agree with you about that, Carl. Um, uh, so the way that I've interpreted the thread, and I think that it's interesting that uh, not everyone interprets the thread this way is that there is a way of responding to the whole argument that doesn't involve metaphysical commitments, but it rather involves methodological commitments about mathematical modeling that are substantive commitments, but they're not metaphysical commitments per se, which doesn't preclude the project of interpreting metaphysically the models of the theory. It just means that it's not a required element to respond to the whole argument. And if that's the kind of, if one has that in view, right, then uh, any sort of sins that involve making metaphysical commitments to points are exactly the sorts of things that this sort of response is attempting to avoid. Gotcha. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, but, but I have to, yeah, but I think you're right, Carl, that, you know, uh, this, this thread has not been woven in as clear of a way as it ought to have been. So anyway, thanks for clarifying the way that uh, these guys are thinking about it, especially Weatherall. Um, that, that's very helpful. And um, I'll go back and reread it with new eyes. Cool. Thanks, Carl. Thank you. Uh, Carl, so it is fair to say that your metaphysics is pointless. Now, <laughs> what are your views regarding uh, the meteorological structure of space-time? Is it a gunk or you are not uh, realist towards uh, a meteorological structure for space-time, or perhaps you want to say that it appears uh, at a certain level of description. I don't know, what are your views from this perspective? I don't, I don't take a, a stand on that at all, Antonio, and I think that probably we're, we're hundreds of years from being able to answer that kind of question. It's a really tough, I mean, really tough. I, I don't even know if I, I, I've read a couple of things about gunkiness. I'm not sure I understand uh, the, the proposal there. What I do want to say is that um, having one clear set of mathematical tools and more or less knowing how to, how to manipulate them, it would be overly bold to just say, okay, so now we know because our theory is successful and we use these mathematical tools that the tools reflect the structure, a deep structure of reality. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm hesitant to take that step. In that, okay, in that sense, I'm pointless or, or a point skeptic, if you want, but uh, but not ready to in, embrace some some different metaphysical view. No, I see. Thank you. We have Brian. Brian, you want to ask something? Uh, yes, please. Thank you. Um, so, so Carl, is it another possibility for uh, your view to simply deny that the tower can buckle and say that it can? In the absence of any pre-existing asymmetry, all it can do is say collapse straight down. Or uh, I, I, I do, it seems like that uh, that might be another way that one could go. Do you see that as inferior? Um, so no, I mean uh, it depends on what the the postulated physics of the world is. So the um, and, and I I haven't uh, looked at the original uh, Mark Wilson. I think I read the paper umpteen years ago because it's a paper uh, from the early 80s. But one, I think what I, when I think about the, the tower buckling example, I'm just having in mind that uh, we stipulate that the laws say that there, it will buckle. Um, and the laws simply don't specify in what direction. Or the laws, sort of like Norton's dome, allow it to buckle and also allow it to just stay there um, without compressing, et cetera. I would, I'd like to be able to talk about the case under various types of hypothetical um, postulated laws. Okay. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to plump for just denying the physical possibility of, of a buckling. Thanks. I'm just worried about the meaning of substance in this whole literature. Um, are we bringing in the substance accident or substance property differences in the Aristotelian sense? When we talk about substance, are we just saying, well, this thing exists because it carries energy and momentum? 
this is something that I don't really understand. So why should we want to use this uh, name or this uh, noun substance still in the literature? Aren't we just saying they exist? Well, uh, the problem with just saying space-time exists is that, um, and, and actually the young man Trevor Title points this out in the paper that, that, that I um, read, um, in the hands of um, analytic metaphysicians these days, existence is cheap. <laughs> uh, you can say just about anything exists. And, and to some extent, there's historical precedent for this um, because you'll see Leibniz talking about how, of course, I, I say that space uh, is real, um, but what I mean is blah, 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 and so forth. So um, you're, you're absolutely right to put your finger on the, the slipperiness of the word substance or substantival and, and how it's taken many different kinds of meanings um, in different discussions over the centuries. Um, but it, equally, um, you, you can't just replace it with something like is real or, or exists. No. So you need, to, you need to get down to saying what, what, what kind of um, reality you're talking about in what sense. And, and I agree that maybe the term substance, substance and substantival versus relational is, is less useful than, than ever. That's what uh, Rhino um, maintains. Yeah. But, never, but nevertheless, we still have uh, the, the task of understanding um, what, what's the, the ideal way of thinking about the depiction of, of uh, physical reality we get from general relativity or quantum field theories or what have you. That, that project remains. Yeah, I agree with you that saying something is real doesn't really say anything. If you say that something is real, I mean, it doesn't add anything to your <laughs> amount of information. So. Yeah. So uh, Antonio, if I could just say sure. um, that this has been a very lively discussion. I appreciate all these questions and, and especially those of you pushing me to be more, uh, more fair to other authors in the literature. I, it's really helpful and uh, it's been fun. So thanks. Oh.